welcome <laughs> to the January 2024 meeting of the advisory panel on racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice systems. Um, tonight, of course, we are doing a large amount of the final effort of pulling the report together. Um, but let us start by going Hollywood Square style and introducing ourselves. I will start in the corner. Erin, could you please start with yourself? Hi, everybody. Good evening. Erin Jacobson. I am the Attorney General's designee to this panel. Great. Laura. Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Carter. I am one of the data analysts for the Division of Racial Justice Statistics within the Office of Racial Equity. Thank you. Witchy. Hi, everyone. Which are to pronounce he, him, his health equity and data systems expert here as an, uh, a community representative appointed by the Office of Racial Equity. Great. Tyler. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director for the Family Services Division of DCF, and I am the uh, DCF appointed, appointed de designee to this group. Great. And Tim's out for the moment. So Elizabeth. <laughs> hey, I'm Elizabeth Morris. I'm the Juvenile Justice Coordinator at Family Services Division. And Elizabeth, thank you again for the spreadsheet. Oh, no problem. It, we were putting it together anyway, so why not everybody benefit? It was great. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner from the Defender General's Office. Great. Jessica. Good evening, everyone. Jessica Brown, she, her uh, community member appointee to the panel and a professor at Vermont Long Graduate School. Great. Judge Morrissey. Hi, I'm Laurie Morrissey. I'm the judiciary designee to this committee. I'm one of the Vermont Superior Court judges. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Uh, Derek. Hi, good evening, folks. Derek Neo Defnick. I'm the liaison from the Vermont Department of Corrections. Thank you. Matthew Bernstein. Good evening, everybody. Matthew Bernstein, child, youth, and family advocate for the state of Vermont. And um, here is a community member. Um, and I will probably have to hop off at some point due to some family obligations. But uh, thanks for having me. OK. Daniel. Dan Bennett, Vermont State. Police, Eton sidekick, and uh, I guess the deputy director for fair and partial policing. Right, Eton? That's right. Now that we have titles, it might as well use it. Uh, <laughs> took only six months. Um, Jack Rose. Hi there. Sorry, I was uh, getting some fast dinner. Um, Jack Rose. I go by Jack or Jacqueline. She, her. I'm at Department of Corrections. I'm the health equity director there. Great. Sheila. Uh, Sheila Linton, she, her, her pronouns. I'm um, community appointee and um, executive director of the Root Social Justice Center. Great. Thanks. And it's good to see you again. You as well. And last but not least, Reverend Mark Hughes. Happy New Year. To uh, you I'm, too. I'm also, I'm also a ton sidekick. <laughs> and, um, I'm um, the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. I'm co-chairing the Health Equity Advisory Commission, and I have no official capacity here. But you are here to give good advice and such. Tim. Uh, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Hey, everybody. That was Tim Leaders Dumont for everybody else. Everybody. My fellow, okay. my fellow hyphenated friend. Exactly. Right, yes, really, the hyphen people. Um, okay, um, now you're going to wonder why the agenda didn't have anything about minutes on it. There's a reason. There was a snafu in um, alerting Orca to the meeting last month being moved a week back. Grant is using that 
as his method for putting minutes together. So the long and short of it is there are no minutes from last month because of the problem, because of the snafu. I apologize for that, although Ann Walker tells me that wasn't my fault. I always assume everything is, so I'm apologizing. Um, anyway, that is what's gone on with the minutes. That's why they're not there. So I apologize. Um, but I also feel like we have to carry on and um, not spend too much time berating ourselves over that. Um, it won't happen again. Um, announcements. Uh, I have only one, but I want to, um, well, no, I should go first because then I know, um, Erin has something she wants to say. Um, oh, hold on. There's one more introduction, a late comer. Jen, introduction. You're muted. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> Sorry for being late. I just realized that since the last time I used my work computer at home, we had changed our uh, Wi-Fi provider. So technical mayhem. Um, in any case, I'm Jen Furpo, she, her pronouns, and I'm a training coordinator at the Vermont Police Academy. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, Sheila is the one who always keeps me honest about things because I start at this point turning into Mussolini to get the report done. And Sheila continues to remind me, has always done this, um, that there's this thing called transparency and accountability and stuff like that. But it's really frightening when I get my fascist on. It's like, you know, I'm like the train will run on time, even if it runs over people. And um, so, Sheila, please, when I, like, get crazy, slap me, or at least electronically, because um, that may happen. She's also heard me say this a lot of times. When we get to this point in the report, um, or preparing reports, um, we will know we've done well if we all can vote for something, more or less, and go home grumpy because it's not exactly what we wanted. So that we should none of us be really, you know, just like outrageously joyous. But OK, I can live with it. And then you go home and you think about who you're going to kill next time and all that. But it goes away. But when we've gotten to that point, we've done it right. Yeah, is not going to be anyone who's going to feel like we've gotten everything here. It's just not going to happen. There's no way that it really can. Uh, but I want to remind us of that because that's important. Um, don't look for being blissful. It's just not real, not real politic. The, the other thing um, that I would say is I think tonight what we're going to do, because there have been some requests given the amount of stuff that came in, certainly at the end, that we spend some time putting things together, maybe adjusting language on some stuff and so on. Um, so you, I would say, please let your commissioners know that we are, the turnaround, this is going to be really quick. We can have one more meeting on this, which is the 13th of February, okay? Um, but that it has to be on the 15th. <laughs> so the poor commissioners are going to have to read quickly. It's not going to be so long. They're not going to be able to handle it. But I just think you might want to give them a little bit of heads up that this is going to be a quick one. Um, let's see. I think that's all I had to say. Aaron, I want to pass it to you. Thank you, you Eitan. Yes. Yes, and I mean, this is related to what you're just talking about with um, with having a good discussion tonight about what's going to go into the report. And I think um, building some clarity for the whole panel about what that will look like um, and hearing everyone out about their thoughts about that. But we don't, because we won't have final language to then do that part you just mentioned, Aton, which is 
take things to our commissioners, our bosses, whatever, for that quick turnaround that we're going to give them a heads up about. I would ask that we not vote on anything tonight, um, but instead that that's something we would do after we have some more clarity about what is going into the report. In other words, it's hard for me to go to General Clark and say, what do you think about this? I think this is what this might look like, maybe. That's that's a that's not a great process. So um, I would just ask that we not vote tonight, but that we vote at our next meeting once we have something finalized to vote upon. And I'd recommend you using the spreadsheet that Elizabeth so kindly provided for us. Um, that is going to make life so much simpler. It really is. Um, that you'll look at it. She's actually figured out how many votes per section of the report. Um, it's really quite lovely. Um, you're going to be able to like read over things and just make a little mark so for yourself. Um, and that'll be really kind of, I think, useful. And so print all that stuff out. Um, as you know, a bunch of stuff came in today. Um, I will, I have not written yet the entire executive summary for obvious reasons, um, but we'll do so and we'll get that to you by email. I'm not going to wait till the next meeting. I'm going to get that to you by email. Um, and I intend to do that really in rather short order. Tim, you have a question. Yeah, well, question and uh, supportive of Aaron's last comment. I wouldn't be able to vote on at least two of the three proposals because I wouldn't have been able to have shared things with the um, executive committee and my and my boss and the executive director's office. So I definitely ap appreciate Aaron's comment. I, I'm in the same boat. Um, and then I know you were referencing it, Eitan, but you're sort of thinking, basically, we might have something to give them on the 13th, maybe that evening, and then say, hey, you guys got, I'm just saying it out loud so that I don't because there are minutes tonight, um, you guys have tw you know twenty four hours to give me kind of yay nay on these other two proposals. Okay, that makes me feel much more comfortable. Thank you. You're welcome, Witchy. Yeah, um, and and maybe that's something Elizabeth could do for us um, since it's your spreadsheet. Um, I was wondering if we could be walked through. Well we're supposed to be doing just like screen share and be like okay review this and put in this cell this thing right so i just want to make sure that i know what i'm doing um elizabeth, okay can you do that elizabeth are you comfortable just sort of i could i guess the question for the group is how what would they like the spreadsheet to, to result in so i think there's one of two options one Everybody could use it for their internal purposes, right? As they're pushing it up to whoever approval, whatever individual in this group needs. Or what I could do is I could add all of the voting members into the spreadsheet so we could utilize a spread like a spreadsheet as a, a check mark for um keeping track of what we have majority of and what we don't have majority of. Does that does that question make sense? Mm-hmm. So if it's the if it's the first option, then use it to whatever capacity is helpful for you as you're preparing how you're gonna vote. If it's the second, I'm happy to make some um and do so. Witchy, you have any thoughts on that? I, I feel like that's an ask for the whole group. Yeah, and I know. And, but... and I'm happy I'm happy to just go with what the group feels. Okay. Okay. Any, uh, with Tyler, I'm sorry, I didn't see yeah, your hand. That's all right. That's all right, Aton. I was just, as I was thinking about this, um, uh, obviously Elizabeth prepared this um, for our own processes uh, and hopefully it'll be useful for other processes. Mm -hmm. And if the group wants to use it all together, that's, I think, great. Um, I just, part of me feels some caution around if we are using it in an organized way outside of this meeting, that that might become problematic because I don't think we can have a shared document that we're kind of doing business in outside of meetings. So if we want to be using it in this meeting, um, you know, there is some that, that that's an approach we can use, but I think certainly 
I will want to use this spreadsheet distinctly and separately as I pass it up through my leadership chain, um, you know, additional. Rebecca. To the extent that my read of each committee's submissions has a number of recommendations, uh, my my understanding is, is we have to get a vote. I mean, that's what those committees came up with was the summary distilling the recommendations. Um, so I think that for transparency's sake, I think we should, as a panel, individual members, when we get to the vote, I think we should be voting on each of the submitted recommendations based on the committees, what they've set, set forward. Uh, in terms of the second look, Elizabeth, from the, uh, that looks good from my end. I just would uh, want the others, particularly the um, Witchy and Sheila, your committee, to make sure that the recommendations are worded the way that it's consistent with your, your proposal. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I would, I would support transparency and having individual individuals on this panel vote on each recommendation. I would think that I think the individual thing works really well too. And I can sort of do a master one for voting. And I can fill that out during the meeting next uh, on the 13th. You know, that then, then we have violated nothing. And I don't have to put on orange. So, okay. Cool. Why don't we start the discussion off with the juvenile justice system? How about that? Everybody be able to pull that one up? I know it's a little awkward. I, I, I really, I admit that, but you know how things are. It's just how it worked. Um, everybody there? We're, okay. Elizabeth, you look like you were about to speak. Yeah, I was. I was just going to respond to Witchy's um, additions and, and, and comments and just say that I, I personally am supportive of, of the small additions that you made and apologize for your name not being included. So just to... There. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Rebecca. As a, as a member on that committee too, which I saw your suggestions, I also agree. And also just as a, as a disclosure, I, as a, I wrote the, for the second look committees draft, I know Tim, you've been asking for name corrections repeatedly. I don't want to go that we had a template that, that someone gave us. And we'll, I assume we'll have the current panel members and we'll go through that in the final draft one in terms of accuracy as to them. Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, yeah, no. Yeah, I don't yeah. ever take it personally. It's it's the most common misspelling and I often don't ever correct it because it, it is what it is. <laughs> Thanks, though. Uh, okay. Other people who, you know, I want to dig in on this, the language. Really? Hot damn. Am I to think, let me just ask this. People are really good with it the way it is. Yeah. I'm not taking a vote. I'm just like getting feedback here, Tim. Yeah. I mean, when I'm, when I'm silent, I hope it's not construed as support um, necessarily because I just don't know. Um, no, I, thing, I get it. Yeah, yeah. One thing to note on this, just because it's I've said it a couple times this week in the legislature, but the juvenile justice system is aimed for rehabilitation exclusively, and the criminal justice system has many goals. Um, and so when someone has a delinquency filing, the, the goal is to engage them with services from some of the great folks on this call. It isn't to criminalize them um, in any way. And so I don't know, and I and I was just looking through it. It isn't, there's nothing in here that I would necessarily change, but having that comment about the different goals of Title 33 as opposed to Title 13 might be helpful as an educational piece for the legislature. Oh, 
Okay. Or can that come up in testimony? Uh, don't find by me. I just, I, I always, legislators think when you file a delinquency that you're filing a, a miniature crime. And that's, that's something that I think it can happen in testimony for sure. But okay. just for, for those that aren't doing the, that type of work every day, it's, it's worth kind of just noting the, the different goals. And I see Elizabeth and Tyler nodding because I'm sure they say, talk to people about it all the time. So. Well, let me raise something, because one thing, you know, there's one part of this that was an or or, an, you know, an either or. So when everyone's happy, I'm like, OK, that's interesting. Um, I looked at the either or section. That's point number three. Use best practices for gathering race, race ethnicity data and in incidents of arrest with youth. RDAP recommends that both law enforcement perception and court perception of the youth is gathered. That's one. Okay, that's that's the overall sentence. Or RDAP recommends that law enforcement perception and self-identification of the youth is gathered at a later time. Or <laughs> our recommendation is that law enforcement perception of the race, ethnicity of youth and self-identification of the youth, if their case is filed with the judiciary. So there are several options there. Yeah. Witchy. Are, are you asking us which option we would I'd want like, to have? Yes, I'd like some discussion on that because we were, I mean, it's great that everyone likes this, but that one is kind of hard to like because they're, I mean, no, it's not. That's not what I meant. It's, um, it's hard to just sort of accept it without any conversation because there were certain moments of or, or, or so I'm kind of like going with those sorts of things. Jen Furpo says option two makes more sense. Um, and, and let me also just put in here, guys, it's I should ask Aaron, the chat is not open meeting, right? I think it is. We turned off the chat at one point. As yeah. a policy, uh, this was way back. Because, I remember. Because um, kind of similar to how we ask that people request a link to this meeting instead of just posting the link publicly, it was really more an issue around like worrying about um, toxic or offensive comments, just being able ah, to like okay. enter into this meeting sphere. Okay. Um, what I don't know, though, is if chats go into the minutes. I mean, they would have to be appear in the recording, right? And then that would have to be recorded by our minutes taker. So I think if people have good, important, substantive things to communicate, please do so not in the chat. Okay, yeah. great. Just as a, a Zoom thing, uh, that when it's when the program saves the files, the chat file is saved separately from the recording. So if you were to just watch the recording, you don't see the chat. Okay, thanks, Jen. We'll pass that on. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. I just wanted to do a little clarification around the option at the end of that. Um, and I'll certainly allow my other committee members to weigh in on on that. But it's really there. It's a it's a one or the other. So there's a recommendation that we would look for this committee to support or not about requiring the gathering of race and ethnicity data where we had some discussion within the smaller subcommittee was what race and ethnicity data we should be recorded from where. Um, and DCF has our own policies that we're striving to, to, to implement fully um, about taking in calls that has us taking in ide identification, racial identification thing that I, you know, it's the, the, the caller, the reporter would have to identify their perception of race, but then for our own purposes of service provision along the line, we want to approach people using self-identified um, race. So for us, we think those are both valuable data points to have, um, but when we gather those data points, it might be at separate times. 
Um, another valuable, and this is the other or, I'll certainly let Rebecca maybe speak a little bit more to it, is saying when we're looking at the court's perception of race or law enforcement, I think both of us are in agreement that law enforcement's perception of race is important. And then the question is, at a later date, is it more important to gather self-identified race or is it more important to gather court-identified perception of race? And so that's the or. That's where the or is. And I think we could have more robust conversation because that might be a com confusing concept um, okay. as we wrap our heads around it. Thank you. Witchy? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think it's worth asking what is it that we want because th these different things will give us different answers. Um, we know that right now race and ethnicity is, is recorded through an assumption based by law enforcement official, even though it's not necessarily clear to everyone outside of this space, um, that is what is happening right now. So what we're seeing is like when we see disparities, we're not seeing actual disparities. We're seeing the, the how law enforcement officials act when perceiving minorities, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, uh, versus when we take a look at the judicial data and we have self-identifying, um, that allows more room for, to to work with actual data of does is this person a BIPOC person? Um, and I think having both allows us to be able to compare, for example, you know, art. Are what how are the perceptions of law enforcement actually interacting with what actually uh, that the race or ethnicity is? So it allows room for extra analysis. Um, but I would be really interested, um, Laura uh, Carter, since you're part of the um, the the data folks at the Office of Racial Equity, I would love your insight on you know what what do we have the capacity for actually analyzing at this moment? And what is really, what kind of answer would we want from the uh, for the administration? I guess you're, Laura, you're on. <laughs> if you know. I, I am unsure. So I'm gonna pass that over to Susanna who I saw un, un videoed herself or whatever. So take it away. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, you know, in, in terms of in terms of capacity and build out, um, this is obviously a, a, a piece of the data set that is going to be really important to us to collect. I know so little about the technology and about the repositories um, and people who understand it keep trying to explain it to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> So how long is it going to take to build these things out? I don't know. I know that we have ADS. We're supposed to have dedicated support for and the Agency of Digital Services, which is the state's IT department. Um, we're supposed to have dedicated support from that department um, and a very handsome appropriation to that department for technology and assistance um, to get the setup for the for the for the division. So I think the question may be twofold. It might be. What do we have capacity for in terms of building out this collection system? And what do we have capacity for in terms of regular routine analysis and reporting on it? Yeah. Um, if the former, then we're going to lean really heavy on our IT friends. If the latter, then I'm going to say we're we're already stretched thin because this, this panel told the legislature the DRJS needed to be five people and it's three right. at its current workload. So you all know better than anyone, um, kind of, kind of where, how that shook out. So all of that is to say a lot of talking to say, I don't know, bro. Got it, Rebecca. I want to um, further tease out the distinction between the two proposals that I think the panel uh, should consider. <laughs> The difference is the first proposal is about collecting perceived race and ethnicity data from law enforcement and the judiciary, period. Uh, that was a suggestion that I made on the committee. Um, 
I did not, and I have not been convinced that collecting self-identification on race and ethnicity from our clients, youth specifically is, is in the context of this data collection point, uh, will be safely handled. Uh, will there, I, I also the purpose, I think the purpose for RDAP has always been, and as established by the legislature to address racial disparities. Perceived uh, race and ethnicity is, is required for that. I worry that um, while other services like DCF talks about collecting self-identification data as a need to collect that kind of data to address whether their services are being administered correctly, right? I see the court delinquency system as fundamentally different. Youth, our clients are being hailed into those courts, not voluntarily. There are charges made against them, delinquency charges. Uh, and so it is a, is a fundamentally a different posture. And while the courts are, must be fair uh, to have that position, the court or ask our clients who are represented by counsel to, and, and youth, we're not talking about adults, to, to self-identify at this stage. I question whether or not there's a need to address the issues of racial disparities. And I question whether or not it'll be safely handled. This, this panel considered these issues of protection and not having this data collection used as a sword against uh, the, these particular people, uh, against them. And we crafted and the legislature adopted our recommendation that the data entity not just have the staffing um, and granted Susanna, not at the levels we recommended, but that there was also critically an independent counsel to guide the data entity that is now created, that, that we're still waiting on that counsel to be created. I understand, Susanna. Um, and that counsel is made up of community members, all of which were the purpose to safeguard the collection of data. I worry that it's just a flat request, a recommendation of the legislature that we do self-identification is too premature. And that's why I do not support that recommendation. Okay. And I just slipping in here before before Judge Morrissey, um, what Rebecca said, I agree. I've been there. Um, so I would go with just the the way it's the first, the first, uh, whatever the first is, the first item. God, I'm losing the ability to speak English. Judge Morrissey. Thank you. So I was just going to say, I think that um, the, I think that it, the data collection is obviously critically important. I think that, in fact, I think Zuzana, Aaron, and Rebecca and I were all on a, a meeting at lunch where that was the focus was collecting data. So we had information when we were making um, position uh, points that we had the information to back it up. And my concern about anything that when you're talking about having the court collecting data that the information the court has is really only as good as the information coming in. There are many times when on a delinquency case where I never see the child. So I'm not sure how that, like who would the court would be collecting that if that is going to be sort of the point where that information is gained. And the youth can come into the juvenile system in so many different, from so many different paths or can be through DCF, it can be through the school, through truancy cases, it can be through law enforcement. And it seems to me that it's the, the, the intake point as the most reliable way of collecting that information in a way that's uh, systematic and reliable. So I would just point out that having the courts collect the information, again, I'm not, there are times that we, we never actually see the youth. If they're diverted out of the system, if they are going through sort of justice, diversion, we never see those kids. So I guess I'm just trying to suggest that whoever's the, 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 intake person that's making the referral to court, I think is the most reliable way to get that information. Okay. Sheila? Okay. I'm going to try to articulate what I want to say, but I'm having a hard time trying to figure out how to put this into words based on everybody's conversation. So I want to say I don't disagree with Rebecca. And um, what I remember is me bringing up a conversation um about this because i feel like there are like what she was saying is there's a few different data points 
one of my main concerns is, is that when do we as people of color get to self-identify? Like, when does that happen, whether it's a child or adult, or when does that actually happen? And are we collecting a data point from the difference between what was perceived by the court or the officer versus what the actuality of the perception or the actuality of the identity of the person is? Because that's a different, I feel like a data point. And that was something that we talked about was there, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to explain this in a way that makes sense to me. It's sort of like how they changed the Vermont harassment laws to be perceived or actual. So in the school systems, right? So if you're discriminating against somebody and somebody calls you the N word, but you're not black, it doesn't matter because that's what they're perceiving you as. So it's either perceived or actual is now the law. And so I'm sort of look at this in the same way as an officer or somebody who's in that power control being like, well, uh, they weren't really this, or I didn't mark them down as being a Latina, but they are. And then they're clearly by whether their skin color or their speech or their origin or their name or whatever identifiables there are, there can be um, lack of truth based on how people want to get out of things. And so I do feel like there's a risk for, especially for youth at certain times to be able to identify and for it become a way of collecting information that might not be viable, but I'm really curious of how we can still collect that. And one of the other things as we talked about is the why. I remember that one of the things I brought up was when, you know, if you're signing a like a civil ticket or something or whatever, I think you have to, uh, they ask you something about race or there used to be something, but why? Like nobody is understanding why are you collecting this information? And I remember the RDEP having a conversation around that needing to be either in law or legislation or something of like, we are educating people. So if we're asking somebody for the collection of race or ethnicity, then we're actually explaining that we're actually doing this because there's disparities in the criminal justice system, blah, 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 blah. And so blah, 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 doesn't happen. We are collecting this rather than us feeling like as people of color, that is being used against us in some way. And so I'm just wondering if there's space, um, regardless of what or we go with, to put in the why piece of it. And I'm a little bit concerned that though I don't disagree with you, Rebecca, I am concerned of when, when youth or anybody will get to really self-identify. And we've talked about from beginning to end of those discretion points that there's discretion points all along the way. So we could argue that at the very beginning is the most important, the middle is the most important, the end is the most important. Like we all have different experiences and understanding of that. So I think that that's a little bit hard for me to suss out. And I'm sorry if I'm not being very clear, but I'm trying to convey feeling uncomfortable um, with some of the some of the material and potentially the direction we're going in. Okay. Elizabeth. Um, yeah, on, and this is on a little bit of a um, not complete separate topic, but listening to everybody's opinions and thoughts, it also occurred to me, and I hate to make this spreadsheet longer, but there might be a potent, there might actually be a potential third option, uh, which is that at this time, art of supports law enforcement perception and, and, um, and doesn't have a opinion on um, the second piece, which is whether or not it would be court perception or self-identification if that charge is filed with the judiciary. Um, so just putting that out there, depending on where people fall in the next month or so. I could live with that. Rebecca, oh, uh, between Rebecca and Aaron, you guys fight it out. <laughs> you put your hands up at exactly the same moment. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, I, I, I think that that language that Elizabeth, as you suggest, uh, would be fair to because it also reflects 
would actually reflect uh, my position on it, which is that I'm still considering it's not a closed box. The other thing I want to throw out there, uh, Sheila, is is and others, is that in the juvenile delinquency system by statute, youth have to be represented uh, are represented by um, the defender general system to the extent there are inaccuracies on race ethnicity data and it is in the best interest of the child you know not in the best of the client's interest right we represent we're the advocate um that is also another way uh to get that correction in terms of self-identity so i just want to put that out there as well these are not unrepresented uh youth in the court system so there's that way it's not sy systemic systematic it would be in an individual case-by-case -case call okay aaron um, I really appreciate this discussion because, you know, one reason for my silence when you um, when we started looking at this section of the juvenile justice report was I don't f I feel ill equipped to choose. Um, and the first sentence of this section says use best practices for gathering race ethnicity data in incidents of arrest with youth. I don't. I don't know whose best practice is, who says, are we saying? Um, and I just don't know the answer to that. What is the best practice here? Um, and so I guess I would appreciate that third option a little bit um, to leave the question open around uh, when charges are filed with the court. But then again, I don't know if then we can say that's a best practice. <laughs> Um, so I just, I kind of float that out there as, as a question about whether, are we also trying to, um, to tell the legislature that we know what the best practice is. I'm assuming when I see that, I'm assuming that people in the field know what that is. Are we saying that in like the process for. With that statement, use best practices for gathering race ethnicity data. Is that just about like how you communicate with the child, how you treat the child? I don't know what that, I guess I just don't know what that, that opening statement means. Or is that opening statement referring to one of the choices that we're going to make here that goes into the report? Uh, Elizabeth or Tyler, do you want to, uh, and Sheila is with you on that one. Um, I think Rebecca has her hands up. She might be looking. Okay, I feel that. like we all probably have <laughs> thoughts, but Rebecca, you got there first. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. I, well, what I was going to say, and I, I think that's an absolutely wonderful question, Aaron. I, I really like the way that you phrased that. And to be frank, I would say that the language of best practices depends on who you're at. Because if you ask, like, you know, I, Judge Davenport, I know not to call on you. I know you've had conversation with national experts where they say, hands down, self-identification is the way to go. But who are you asking? You're asking a national center of judges, right? Like, so that in itself is a hard thing to say. I will say from my opinion, as one person on the committee, that it is this group's opinion as to what is the best practice. Um, which is one of the many reasons why this section doesn't, out of all of the three different subcommittees, doesn't have one um, very specific recommendation and while, why we're having this discussion here. Um, and I'll, I'll say this as the non-designee person, I am very comfortable with, in particular, the community members on this group and what their votes are having a huge voice on this. On, on what gets submitted to the legislature. So I will just say that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think Rebecca and then Witchy and then Judge Davenport. Erin, I would say as part of that committee, best practices was um, not conceived in a, in a vacuum. And then footnote four, there's a cross reference to our prior reports, particularly. What do we cite there? The 2021 report where we we really dove deeply into how a data entity should be um, 
built, if you'll recall. And in there, we were guided by certain ideas and toolkits. And so we cited some things there. And so I, I wanted to give the legislature a reference back to us not making this recommendation a vacuum, that we actually talked about a lot of best practices. And you can and so you can take a look at those sites there. Good idea. Thank you. Witchy? Um, and maybe I got lost a little bit in the thread of all the different ideas, but I just wanted to loop back on the possible third option, which excluded the self-identification and wanting to make sure, you know, that we, if we do end up going a route where we're saying, uh, no to that, that the con that this conversation does not get lost. It needs to either, you know, be in its own paragraph or a, a footnote or, or something that describes our argument for, against, and and sort of like what, what we are wrestling with in this for the legislature to also consider as they read through this recommendation. I agree. Let me, let me just make a point here before Judge Morrissey. Uh, I'm sorry, not Judge Morrissey, Judge Davenport, forgive me. Um, why don't I just want to mark this so that it's on the recording and Grant will have it. I would really, I like that. I think we're not going to get to a moment of here. We never have. I'm not buying that we are now. Um, and I would say that a note to the effect of that there has been a lot of discussion about this, but not a lot of agreement. Here are the issues. Like, and I love those footnotes that take up a page. You know, I love those. I worked on my dissertation so I could have at least three of them. Um, and so I think having a footnote like that would be really, really good rather than sit here and think we're going to work this out. Because we've had this discussion so many times over different things. That's my recommendation. Uh, Judge Davenport. I was just going to say in response to Aaron's point and what Elizabeth said that there was somebody from the National Center for State Courts at the who is up in Vermont who is in Vermont now and spoke to the legislature this afternoon but also spoke with the court in a meeting that I was in this morning and in terms of is there a best national best practice out there and the answer I think at this point is no it, it 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 is it is all of the states are wrestling with this um and um and trying to figure it out but i don't think there's any one state that kind of stands out like oh yeah they got the right answer and let's follow that uh that um uh they're all wrestling with it as well as it's the the Folks on the national level are wrestling with it. Department of Census is wrestling with, you know, should ethnicity be a separate group or is it should be, should it be part of the, you know, race and ethnicity all in one thing? So it, it, I think that we're in a period nationally of flux and it will sort itself out uh, and someone will come up with something that everybody goes, oh yeah, that was right. Why didn't we think of that? Um, but I don't think we're there yet. Okay, I want to recommend that instead of saying use best practices, we say discern. That's in um, taking into account what the judge just said, discern. And I say that because for a number of reasons. Okay, great, I'm glad that's going. I would, that would be my change would be say discern best practices for gathering race ethnicity and oh my god don't lose a tooth people the fake one screws your tongue up use best practices for gathering race ethnicity data in incidents of arrest with use and just say discern best practices remember here <laughs> remember here we are not 
writing the legislation. We're making recommendations. And we are not the only people who are going to weigh in on this, right? There's going to be testimony. I mean, I'm assuming they're going to read it. Um, and that there's going to be testimony. This is going to go through so many other um, iterations and movements. I think if we leave it there, that would actually work. And it's simple. That's my recommendation. This might be too whatever, but um, is there appetite for amending that slightly to say discern established and emerging best practices? Because one of the things that I find is um, some of our institutions have a real uh, adherence to the way things are and a real aversion to um, taking on things that maybe are not long practices, but might well be best practices and the sort of uh, openness to processes that may be more community driven, which is something we've seen popping up more recently. It feels minor, but. I like it. Can you say it again, just so we have it on the tape? Yeah, um, discern, established and emerging. Best practices. I love it. Okay, Laura. I just uh, I just shared this with Susanna separately, but I was also thinking about the importance of being consistent with whatever best practice we decide. I don't know if that would be appropriate to add to the report, but just as a group and just myself thinking kind of out loud that you know, we want to do our due diligence in collecting this data, then it needs to be consistent across whatever systems we're trying to apply those best practices to. Okay. We've got that in too, consistency. All right, uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I just, just to add to that, number two does talk about ensuring that there's uniformity. Um, and then number three is the, okay, well, what does that mean? What does that uh, mean? So I absolutely agree with you because I think, I don't think I know when I've asked different law enforcement agencies, okay, where is this? Like the, currently, right now, when you put down race and ethnicity information form 101, the youth was arrested five minutes ago, it differs. I technically, law enforcement are supposed to send race and ethnicity information to the FBI, it's public for juveniles, for, if anybody's interested. Um, and I've asked, there's like, there's a Vermont person who's attached to that, who's supposed to kind of facilitate that. And I've asked, that person in particular, oh, you know, is the FBI telling law enforcement agencies how they should be asking this? And the response I got was, oh, you have to go ask every individual law enforcement organization um, and talk to the chief and see how every, and, and maybe you'll get an answer. Okay. Yeah, I think that is, this is an important point on, because this conversation is not just happening in the judiciary spaces. I know Senate GovOps or the GovOps committees have been talking about, you know, imputed versus self-reported. And um, because the, for example, the Criminal Justice Council falls under the purview of Senate GovOps, this is a conversation that they may be having somewhat in a vacuum, um, but it's effectively talking about the exact same thing and the same systems that we're talking about. Um, so in terms of ensuring consistency, I think it's important that we talk about harmony, not just across these relevant systems, but also that the policymakers we're talking to recognize that they're all having the same conversation in parallel to each other. Uh, Judge Davenport, and then I want to yeah. try to sum some things up here. Just briefly, um, yeah, currently the information that the court is getting on race and ethnicity from Form 101 that the law enforcement officer fills out, what I've been told is that it depends on whether um, whether the juvenile was stopped but was never take never taken to the police department. Um, so for a less serious crime, they were just cited, right? So then it's the law enforcement officer's perception because the law enforcement officers are trained that they shouldn't ask about race and ethnicity on a on a stop because that that could could trigger 
uh, difficulties. But if the juvenile is taken to law enforcement, to the, to the police station, uh, they're then asked to self-identify in a lot of cases. So the data that we have is mixed data anyway. It's not all law enforcement perception. It Some of it, depending on how the, how the juvenile is processed, de, um, de, could be self-identification. And that gets at the consistency issue that Laura raised. Yeah, yeah. I'm going a big ask here of our, our our GCF contingent. You guys have written a beautiful thing. Can you write one more little thing here that puts these things together? Send it to me and I'll send it out. I would really be grateful. Yeah, I'd have to do that. Just to be clear, we are changing, you know, the the title essentially to what we just talked about. And then we are theoretically doing the law enforcement perception and then going into the detail of this conversation. Right. Okay. And saying discern best practices that, you know, that are emergent and established. That's all. Okay. And I'll send it out. Are we cool with this then? It's okay to say yes or no, you know? Okay. Erin is actively nodding her head. So uh, Jen's nodding her head. Every, I don't know what witch he's doing because he's not even here. So I, <laughs> it's probably warm and cuddly, but okay, great, good. Thank you, witchy. Um, all right, let us move on then to the community safety review subcommittee's work. Okay. Which which subcommittee? What? Your committee. Like that's that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're doing well. This is going really, really well, actually. Um comments. I I hope you had time. If you need time to look through it, let me know now so I can just, you know, we can take a couple minutes, three, four, five minutes and give you time to look through. Does anyone need that? I guess not. Okay. The floor is open for discussion. Uh, I understand. So as uh, Jennifer, um, you had oh sorry, Jennifer Farfa, <laughs> you had uh made a comment, and I was hoping you could elaborate on it, um, a little bit and maybe contextualize it for the for the whole group. Sure. So, um, for those of you who don't know, my job at the academy is largely around training and coordinating training. So I I'm always looking at this at through a lens of what are we already doing that people don't know about, and also. How can we meet the community's needs and expectations um, with unfortunately almost never getting any more resources to do so? Um, so what the email that I sent out was based on that beautiful uh, Excel spreadsheet that came out that broke broke down some of the training stuff pretty pretty simply, even I could grasp it. Um, so like the pre, so what I'm looking at is um, like the pre-training assessment. Absolutely agree that folks need to be ready to absorb a training. Um, but my question is, how do we, how, do you guys know how you would assess somebody's readiness for this training? What are you looking to happen when somebody's not ready for the training? Um, which is complicated by the fact that in order to maintain your law enforcement certification, you have to take fair and impartial policing training every other year. Um, and to, to be quite honest, there was there's a fair number of, of things that were on the list of stuff that y'all want law enforcement to be trained in doing that we're trying to do, and maybe we just need more help to do it better. And that help might not necessarily be having Montpelier decide <laughs> how to do it, being neither trainers nor experts in fair and impartial policing. I'd rather hear from the experts. I'd rather hear from you guys on what we could do better and how we could do it better, I guess. 
Yeah. Uh, so I'm really glad you elaborated on that. Uh, my initial gut reaction to that is like, we have in in currently how we're working on this, we have neither the 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 time nor the money to dedicate to being able to develop something that mm -hmm. like that that you're saying. Um, I, I think maybe that that ask can be changed to, um, you know, task consultants with or you know mm -hmm. dedicate resources to. Um, but it, and while Sheila and I and and other folks could get together and definitely like have an answer for that, that's like that's a long term project that I don't know is necessarily um we're capable of doing at the moment before this report and and maybe Sheila has some more helpful suggestions than I did and uh, just also uh before our, <laughs> before Sheila Jensen if people want to see what our curriculum looks like public information requests are a thing I mean I don't we are not in the in the business of trying to keep the public from knowing what and how law enforcement is training is trained unless it's something that would compromise their safety. So make the asks. If y'all want to know what we teach, make the asks. If you want to come and observe training, you know, let us know. We can we may be able to work that out. I'll be teaching on the 19th. Mm -hmm. And then in February 12th. Yep. Yeah, and then probably again sometime in uh, April or May, but I'll send you and Dan an email. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. That would be great. <laughs> it, it's it's not just about what you teach. It's from my understanding from you giving a presentation, I think in the first year it was on the RDAP, which was a long, long time ago. Um, it was about, and, and correct me if I'm wrong of who makes up the rules, but um, basically being allotted X amount of hours for this particular type of curriculum. So for, um, for diversity, equity, whatever, it's like, it was like two hours or whatever, um, that was presented to us back then of having to have this type of training in this field. So my understanding, it's not just what you teach, but it's how much, what is the reoccurring of that teaching? And so what mm -hmm. I heard was, well, each academy when they come in every year or whatever it is they do it like once a year and if somebody comes in the middle or something they don't even necessarily get it because it's at this time of the year so i heard a lot of no. things from <laughs> different re different um presentations but my mm -hmm. understanding again is that when we had these discussions it wasn't just about okay we would like to see this what was countered with that is well we only have these amount of hours that are being paid for that is required for them to do this and so there's a little bit of a glitch I feel like with being like okay we believe they need this type of training and this type of training will take 30 hours rather than two hours that was originally allot allotted and then how does that work um how does that actually pan out and what does that actually mean yeah so I think the disconnect might be a, a little bit of how weird our training system is. Um, so the 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 place where we have a really finite amount of time is in the basic academy. When our brand new baby cops come to the academy and live with us for 17 weeks and we try to make them awesome. That's just one tiny drop in the bucket of law enforcement training. What folks miss a lot of the times is the mandatory in-service training that everybody has to get to maintain their certification annually. Some of that is stuff that they are told they have to take. They have to recertify with their firearms. They have to take X number of hours of use of force. I don't know how many, cause I'm not a use of force gal. Um, on even numbered years, they have to get domestic violence training. Odd numbered years, they have to get fair and impartial. And then they've got about 30 hours 29 or 30 hours of additional training that they have to get, but nobody says what specifically that has to be. It's whatever their agency deems is appropriate. So I could say, okay, I'm officer Furpo and I really want more training in how to take apart 
I don't know, tasers, or I want more training on how to be a better, uh, to better respond to mental health. Because even though we know it's not law enforcement's best, best job to go and deal with that, people are going to keep calling us. So I'd like to do a better job. So they'll ask for more training there, or they'll seek out that training. And then, then that training counts towards their annual requirement. I don't know if that straightens, if that straightens it out a little bit or not. Yeah, I mean, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. I would love to give them more of everything. And quite frankly, I think 17 weeks is a ridiculously short amount of time to take somebody who just graduated from college or got, you know, got out of the military and say, okay, in 17 weeks, you're going to go out and, you know, have the ability to take away somebody's personal liberty and all that good stuff. But don't tell my executive director I said that. <laughs> uh, well, I guess a, a well, actually, go go ahead, and Rebecca. Which is sorry, I, I was going to move on to a different point. <laughs> okay, so 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 then um, so we have the ability to move on to a different point, uh, Jennifer. I I I think maybe it would be awesome if we can get um, if you're into it possibly so it's suggesting some language that we can incorporate in this so the asks are more appropriate um whether that you feel like that is that we need curriculum building specifically with community representatives or you know more money or or whatever it is that you feel could help us get to closer to what we're trying to recommend um, and nobody will know you wrote it nobody will know you wrote it <laughs> even better yeah i mean i'm i'm happy to um take a take a second look and make a, a stab at it um and see what I see if I can can be of any assistant to this uh, the other thing to know is that we are in the middle of a giant three-year project where we're sending out like right now we're doing job task analysis which is really boring data collection stuff so if you have any connection with law enforcement I'm looking at you Dan Bennett and you get a job task analysis um survey fill it out, right? Because we're gathering information to, so that we know what cops are actually doing so that we can teach them to do it better from the beginning. And that's just step one. And it's going to turn into an entire curriculum revamp is the the goal I'm given to understand. Um, and I, I guess I'll just slide in here. If um, I won't go into it now, if anyone has questions about um, the basic course in fair and impartial policing. Um, just ask me um, and ask Dan. Um, I designed it some while ago. Um, it goes through continual revision. We initially, oh my God, I think we had two hours initially when I started this. And I looked at people like, are you high? And now we have six. Yeah. And now we have six. And part of that includes a screening of Anna DuVernay's film 13th and a discussion of it, which is always a really, really um, grave moment in the in the six hours. So if you want to talk about this, um, I won't fill up the airwaves now, but um, I can. I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> so if you'd like that, let me know. <laughs> Rebecca, you you keep like having your hand up and we keep jumping on top of this, but. No, no, I, I, I was going to move off of the subject of training entirely into another section of it. Can we do that, everyone? Okay, good. Go for it. Um, first, uh, Sheila, which she, this is really really a lot of work so thank you yeah a lot of great information and distilling from lots of sources and, and recommendations so thank you my i just wanted to um put voice to what Aton forwarded to the panel i had one suggestion uh going to a substantive recommendation change and that's to page whoops i don't see a page number the last page and it's relating to the section recommendations, reallocation of responsibilities, specifically the bullet 
concerning decoupling traffic stops. And um, there's no question in terms of what you were saying to build up to this point, in terms of why um, restricting traffic enforcement activity uh, is problematic, is, is, is desirable in terms of addressing racial disparities. The recommendation there was very local, uh, recommending the legislature should make an exception to towns seeking alternative ways. And I don't suggest changing that. I, I would suggest doing an and, uh, and consider alternatives generally to traffic law enforcement um, that, that uh, consider alternatives to traffic law enforcement that do not require police officer initiated traffic stops. Some context to that recommendation is that the legislature already has a bill at the state level, not at the town level, considering such alternatives. Um, that is H-176, that's mm -hmm. entitled Secondary Enforcement of Violations of Traffic Laws, where if passed would make it that law enforcement could not enforce uh, certain traffic violations unless there was a separate um, criminal violation or some other violation. And, and it's more complicated than that. So that's called roughly secondary enforcement. Uh, Eitan forwarded the Vera Institute's report on this, where they dropped down with even more recommendations, which I don't bother to suggest here. But there are many. And um, I just wanted to share with everyone that our legislature is already considering this at the state level. Thank you. So other thing, other comments, other comments, other concerns. Uh, good Lord, what is your name? Tim. Good, good Lord, Ethan. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's it's, it's a, been a long day. It's a Tuesday that feels like a Thursday. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but um, is it a Tuesday? I think it, it is, is Tuesday. Okay, good. Um, Witchy, I was just gonna let you know. I um, will send you. It's it's not doesn't have to do with the recommendations, but I'm gonna send you uh, data from CSG and the FBI. That's as of last year. That shows um, crime in some respects trending upwards. Um, one just to note is a 166 percent increase in homicide since 2012 in Vermont. Um, so I, I will send that to you. Also, VSP or I never know, VSP or DPS produced like a 2022 crime report that's linked online. So I'll send that to you just so you have data from last year and the 2023 data hasn't settled yet. I know there's all sorts of stuff that goes up to the federal government and and likewise. Um, so that I don't know when that gets produced. I don't know, Jennifer or anyone else on here, when that 2023 FBI data settles, but probably not in time for this report. Um, but I have been talking about data all week on the crime front. Um, and I will certainly say anecdotally, our, our state's attorneys um, and victim advocates are, are feeling a, a, an increase in, in, um, in work and in, in crime in, in Vermont um, that I would be remiss to just stay silent on um, in any, in any form, honestly, right now. Um, so, and that, like, and I'll, I'll keep saying it, but that the CRG report shows that disproportionately in the context of this group in particular, people of color and women are disproportionately victims of crime in Vermont, um, despite, you know, despite the, the disparities uh, that we know in the other contexts. So um, I don't know if there's a place for that in this report, but they're kind of ready made things. You don't have to add anything. You could just put in a new link um, for certain things. So I'll send that to you uh, right now, which you. Okay. Rebecca. I would also I, I would actually recommend that we do not throw in select data points to this set of recommendations. Maybe there is some other recommendations that you can point to, Tim, but there is nothing in the recommendations that Witching Shield has produced that's relating to homicide directly. I so, think if you want Rebecca, to sorry can, that... I, can I finish? Can I finish? Yeah. There are I have also been in the legislature today where data came up uh, on on public safety on a different subject retail theft. 
and data from there, including FBI, shows a downward trend over a longer span. So the issue about data and, and public safety is a complex one. And to, to throw it out without even putting some anchoring with racial disparities as to what and how this fits with specific recommendations, I find just is, is bringing in something that is not relevant for this report. That's with all due I'm respect, saying. Richie has a 2020 reference to 2020 FBI data in, in this report. So I just wanted him to have the most recent FBI data from 2022. That's why I brought it up. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Tim. Um, Rebecca, thank you for stepping in and, and keeping it in scope. Um, Tim, I'll look through the data and I will see, you know, if there are things that are relevant, especially, you know, considering if I have old data that I'm referencing that hasn't has a newer data point, um, then uh, for sure we should be updating that data. So thank you. Yeah, and Rebecca, I'm so sorry. I thought you were you're done speaking. My camera is a little lagged, and I apologize. Um, for, for interrupting you. And uh, I know we can have lots of discussions about data and, and um, crime on the on the rise is what we are experiencing. And, and I appreciate your perspective with absolute respect and you know, apologies if I was interrupting you. Okay. Aaron. Um, <clears throat> this is on a different topic on uh, public oversight. So in particular, I think, um, in the report, um, you are, or in your write-up, you're referencing citizen review boards, and you talk about wanting the legislature to create a model policy for citizen review boards. And I, please, anybody in this panel or in this meeting, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe the legislature would be the body to create a model policy. You know, they create laws. Um, and so I'm just wondering about if you're, if what you would be recommending as a model policy, who would be, uh, you know, the body of folks to, that you might recommend doing that other than the legislature. Like the criminal justice council? The council could be one. Uh, I suppose the RDAP could try to do that. Um, not this year. No, Aton. I'm not saying by before okay. February 15th. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just throwing out different ideas for like groups of folks who might be, um, could be, you would recommend be charged with that role. Um, and then also just recognizing too, I mean, and for me, I do question how much, uh, direction we would want from Montpelier on, um, citizen review boards, which are just so hyper local um and you know built from communities up so just a question about that and i will also just say in looking at the list of votes i created i i think that that's one that i missed appropriately because i put in two votes on model policy for citizen review boards but not the overall arching recommendation that a, a model policy be created to begin with Okay. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Tim, is your hand still up or? Oh no, sorry. Okay. Can I can I lower it? Yes. There we okay. Go. I just thought I I didn't want to miss you. Um, anyone else? Okay. Listen. Let me ask one thing. When you all send these new things to me. Can I ask that you include in the subject line today's date, 1-9-24? Because I get so much email from us all that I'm going to get to a point, I'm going to start including things from a report from 1870. I mean, it's really going to get kind of muddy here. So I would really appreciate it just in terms of helping me put it all together if you would just put the date, today's date in the subject line of your email. So that'll like clue me in this poor brain to say, hi, you really need to pay attention to this one. Okay, just that's all I'm saying. Thank you. All right, shall we move 
on or do people have more things they would like to raise on this on community safety reviews? Okay, let us go on to the second look legislation. Um, and I got to find that one. <laughs> Also, bear in mind um, that we also got some notification through Tim this afternoon um, about what SAS feels about this. We also got some input this morning for, through Aaron from the Attorney General's office for language that they would like to see included in this um those were the two big things that i got sent today okay now that i'm getting a little bit into the weeds with these votes um, do we need a vote? And this is a this is a question, not rhetorical. Do we need a vote about supporting second look legislation overall, and then going into the so there would be four votes from second look, and it, the the answer might be no. I know I would appreciate that personally. Then let's do it. If one person on the panel wants to do it, then let's just do it. So yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. Sorry, forgot the please part. But yes, I think if if one person wants it, it needs to be done. Rebecca. I'd like to share this much, having spent so much time on the second look committee from RDAP. My understanding was that we were, that RDAP had landed on this subject as supporting second look legislation generally. So to the extent that what Elizabeth is asking and what is, is unfolding here is, is, is a replay of that, I just wanna make sure that that is reflected too. Um, I thought that we had already as a panel um, supported second look legislation as a concept generally, which is why we had developed this committee to, to analyze it, but it, Tim is shaking his head. so. I'll, uh, I'll let others share. Okay, Tim? Yeah, so I mean, I've, I've dug through this in both the Sentencing Commission and in this group with some of our prior SAS folks, and um, we couldn't respond to the most recent recommendation until it was out from this group, but even prior to that, um, yeah, that's not my recollection. It certainly would have been before my time. I did speak with Evan um, Meenan, who was the prior person here and on sentencing, and he also had the same perspective. And I think sort of regardless, there's something that's before this group now. I've had the opportunity to share that with the executive director and with the uh, executive committee, and um, they're not supportive of that, nor the bill last year that was referenced, um, not in your report, but at the conference that was put on. My sense is not that this is being cut, though. By any stretch of the imagination that this is being cut from the report, I, I think it's just, it's sort of, I, I mean, my what I'm gathering is that we would do a vote um, and just sort of a roll count, basically of of who's who's on and who's you know who's not and sas is not um ag i guess is with this language um the a the ag is not in support of second look legislation the ag is certainly in support of the rdap doing its work on you know, the second look subcommittee on all okay. of the um, different thinking and findings that 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 subcommittee yes. prompted 
Um, and certainly the AG is in support of um, much of the of, of the concepts that came out of the second look subcommittee and re other related possible reform efforts right. um, that that relate to sentence reconsideration or people being released before the end of their maximum. So, so what we're looking if I were if I had to vote right now on does the attorney general support S155, I'd have to say no. But that's a different question from you know what's going into RDAP's report, which I would emphasize again is not the AG's report. Uh, Elizabeth and then Witchy. Yeah, I was just getting to say maybe I have an incorrect assumption. So I would love clarity. And what, maybe I'm getting too much into the weeds because I've like volunteered my hands to help keep track of the vote. But I was under the interpretation that everything that's been written is going to end up in the report mm -hmm. regardless. And it's just going to say and list if there's any dissent. Yes. Um, which would mean to your your question, Rebecca, is that my suggestion that there be a vote of, you know, who support second look legislation would by no means take it out by at the report. And that's by no means what I was suggesting. Witchy. Um I'm wondering if um um if there was like an accompanied memo of like why there wasn't a support and not not that I think we should get into discussion but more like to know why um okay um it's it's an interesting question um and I'm addressing this I guess to Aaron as representative from the AG and Tim as representative from SAS is that something that you all can produce? Yes, no? it's been produced and everyone has it in their email. We would right. appreciate it if, if that were included in the report. Okay, um, so it's that, like an appendix. So that I don't get fired, yes. I understand, <laughs> yes, like an appendix. Yeah. Um, Aaron, do, is that something that is pop? No, okay. No. Okay. This the attorney general statement is what I sent around. That's well, it. what I sent to you, Aton, and then you kindly forwarded to everybody. And that's that's the attorney general statement on second look. Okay. Not, you know, things change in the legislature. Things change when new new developments come up and new proposals are floated. Um, this is what we we would like to see in writing right now. My sense, and please correct me, everyone, if I'm wrong, is that we have a lovely written exposition of the second look thinking from the subcommittee, um, and that we put that in, and then we have a sentence saying the attorney general would like, you know, this noted that they, you know, a support for what the subcommittee is doing, but does not necessarily support what the conclusions are of the subcommittee at this moment. And a similar thing with you, Tim, from SAS, not you, because I know it's not you. I know it's SAS. Um, and, um, and then put that in as an appendix at the end, at which point it's a rather layered presentation that seems to me to represent where we're at, at a, as a group right now. Yeah? That sounds good to me. And I think what would what will also be communicated that way is that the vast majority of RDAP members support second look legislation. Yeah. Rebecca. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Witchy's question, which I, I which was, I, as I understood it, a further explanation as to why uh, SAO and AGs are not supporting second look. And Tim, I understood you referred us, both of you referred us to the statements that Aton shared earlier. Tim, I just looked at, at the memo that you provided um, 
And one of the questions I had about it, uh, you indicate that the, um, in your memo, let me pull that up. I have it right here, ready to go. I can share my screen too, if that's helpful. Oh. Um, Okay, for me, yeah, that's, that's I great. can't find it. Yeah, I'll, I can share it right now. I know we all got a lot of a lot of emails. I'll share it right now. Okay, it's it's your opening. Um, here, let me go back to you. Can and you I'm share? sharing. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yes. Cool. So, Tim, my question is, um, is is it that middle paragraph, and it's around footnote? For that sentence, you talk about uh, the questions that, that are in concerns, and and you and you include an attachment, and then you say further the SAS EC. I'm not sure everyone here knows what the EC stands for. Executive count, uh, committee is it? Defined in the second paragraph right here. Okay, got it. Sorry, in EDO yep. executive director's office. Um, so executive committee and. Uh, informed they do not support as but here's the next sentence i had a question on while the opinions amongst individual states attorneys may vary uh the executive committee and executive director's office are not in support question is is do you have can you provide to us uh the individual states attorneys in each county's position on this so i'm not trying to be Crass, if that's my job, what my job was, it would be all I did 24 seven in terms of the types of things The my supervisory structure, which I had described in a prior meeting is the executive committee and the executive director are the executive committee is elected by the other state's attorneys as a leadership group among themselves, which directs the executive director's office. Um, in my conversation with, uh, we meet with all the state's attorneys a couple of times a year, um, and even then, Typically, not all 14 show up, but in a conversation with 10 that appeared at a meeting on the 8th, um, all of those, and I think the folks that were not in that meeting were Essex, Chittenden, and Caledonia. Actually, Orleans called in, so there was 11 there, um, but the other 11 um, were not in favor of, of second look. Um, but in terms of the nimbleness of my job, I have to, I meet with the executive committee every two weeks, including this Friday. And so um, my job would be impossible if I was doing everything that, you know, a tally sort of thing. Um, before the 15th, I'm happy to share your recommendation with all for the, before next month, I'd be happy to share that and get that tally. Um, but the, uh, the only uh, state's attorneys uh, last year that saw S-155, um, no state's attorneys reached out to me. You know, people, they look at all the bills I sent. Part of my job is I track all the legislation that affects the criminal justice system at our department. And no one reached out saying, that's a great bill. It never got testimony, et cetera. But to answer your question in a long format, um, in part because of the nimbleness of this group combined with what I try to do on the other side of my job. Um, the I could absolutely do that, but before doing that, I wanted to make sure it was kind of whatever it was, was, was what I should send out. Um, I had a pretty good idea from what you had shared last time, which is what I shared with the executive committee, which then resulted in this memo. Um, and this is the memo that I, we're, we're asking be included, but um, it's sort of, I'm not trying to be crass, but I, I, it's my common disclaimer that the, you know, individual opinions of state's attorneys may vary um, because otherwise I would be worthless at the legislature and worthless in groups like this. I have to have a smaller group that directs my activity. Wishy? Huh. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at this first concern. I don't know if there are more, but just wondering, uh, just one clarification around that question. Are they asking if the DOC or the Vermont Judiciary presented Vermont data to RDEP in this, um, in our discussion around second look? Yeah, that, that would be one question. And I also oh, asked any more. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, there's a ton, all these, I have a whole list of okay. questions. Yeah. 
Um, can somebody just forward that to me so I can take a look at it offline and 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 maybe try to understand a little bit more? Yeah, but just in terms, of, this isn't something that's going to change this this memo from my my perspective. I'm happy to try to get a list of all the state's attorneys, but I wanted to get it off so that it, this wasn't a drag to what you were doing. Um, yeah, that's fine, and I'm not yeah. asking for a change. I just want to make sure that I understand where the department is. Um, on yeah, I'll send it to you right now. Thank sure. You. I can stop sharing, but that, that was basically here. The list of questions on the second page, starting on the first page, and the first page is some um, introductory language. Well, thank you, Tim. I was just trying to get clarity, and and, and again. It's not that the recommendation from the second work committee on RDAP is is endorsing us or is endorsing an actual bill. Right. It's, it's much more broad. I think Elizabeth's Excel spreadsheet captures that. So I would hope that if you have a chance to survey the state's attorneys around the state, because uh, it, it, your 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 memo indicated there might be some difference of opinion by state's attorneys. Uh, I believe the only one that has indicated support in the past, and it was not support in the way that you might think, was Sarah from, from Chittenden. She had indicated an interest in this topic, not necessarily the bill last year or this proposal, but an interest in this topic and an openness to this topic. Um, Sarah is someone I work with every single day, and, and but she's not on the executive committee, but I still try to, if someone reaches out and said, Tim, I know the 13 states attorneys are feeling this way, but can you also say this? I always make sure to say whatever that is as well, for sure. I can ask her uh, how her she's feeling. Tim, I have one point here that I'm not entirely sure how to phrase it. Give me one second, Judge Morrissey. This won't take very long. Oh, that's okay, um, no problem. I'm just having trouble actually with the, uh, the emoji there. So take oh. your time. Take your time. <laughs> I know the feeling. Um, I, there, at the very top, Tim, and I know this isn't you, I'm, I'm just putting that out there, but um, I think it's going to be, I'm, I'm taking a wild guess here, but I don't think I'm wrong, that the majority of the RDAP is in support of this. That's why we did it in the first place. We voted on that a long time ago. Was this going to be something that was going to be in the report? Um, so when it says RDAP second look subcommittee, that specificity is somewhat misleading, I find. In and, other words, okay, how, how so? say the RDAP. So I say that in part because I was on the subcommittee at yeah. one point and, and, and resigned because I didn't want my presence on it to be seen as support. Right. Uh, and so, um, for me, it was a separate group that was working, and I wanted to be respectful of that group's identity, which is why I, I wrote that. No one else wrote that. I wrote. That. Okay, I, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm yeah. I'm just saying. I I think I what it implies here is that it was three people or four people who came up with some great ideas, and that maybe the rest of the RDAP doesn't agree, and I don't know that that's accurate. Oh, and that wasn't my intent either. No, I know it wasn't. Yeah, I yeah. know it wasn't, but would, that's why. Would you feel more comfortable, and Rebecca, would you feel more comfortable if I changed, I think it's in that third paragraph, or wherever it mentions that subcommittee, if I just said, um, what, well, whatever, however you guys want me to put that, I'd be happy to change that because it won't change the, the substance. If, whatever you guys want me to write for that, I could change. Rebecca, do you want to weigh in here? I don't know whether I'm like just, you know, being silly or not it, it just seems to me that it no no i thank you Aton, for raising that okay i i, 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 just, think, I think it just is uh the panel you just referenced the panel yeah it's the panel oh. it's the panel i oh, mean man. in the united states government you don't get to you know it, it, i mean well, the only thing right is that I, you yeah, know <laughs> i'm on the panel and i don't feel that way and so that that's kind of why I wanted to distinguish that. Right. And that's I, I sort of tried saying it. We appreciate that a majority of the RDAP may submit second look draft recommendations. And that's why I tried kind of right. showing that in some form to the legislature. That's I see. Why I tried doing that. 
Um, I mean, I prefer not to, to change it because to me, it was a group that was working diligently for a long time at, led by Rebecca. And, you know, I, I did leave the group, but it wasn't out of dis, it wasn't a sign of disrespect. It was more like you guys do your thing and I don't want to be, a, I don't want to get in the way. I'm, yeah. I'm also not trying to disrespect your position, but I'm also at the, at, I need to represent what the majority of this body as a whole is putting forward. And so I think that it's use, I mean, the, your letter already makes the distinction that you're trying to make. I think putting it at the top like that is somewhat problematic. So, and this would be basic in the third, is that just in the third paragraph? It was noted no, by the article. No, it's at the top of the letter. The entire top. Oh, oh the 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 subject. Our yes. part of second like Yeah, so I can definitely change that. That's no problem at all. Um, would that be Would that be okay? And then leave the body the way it is. I'm I, yeah. I'm not. Let other people ask answer that. I was just addressing that because okay. I think that Thank that you. sets and it now, up now in such a way about. that I find that problematic. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry, Tim, for what it's worth, Aton's concern just flows to the same in that first sentence. I mean, at some point, it's no longer a draft recommendation is the point. It's if you want to update it, that's that's all. Yeah. Judge Morrissey. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, alert folks that the, judi I, the I think while the judiciary absolutely supports the as comprehensive and as reliable a way as we can collect data as possible, I think the judiciary will not be taking a position on the second look legislation or on the um, proposal to raise the age for um, youth coming into the um, the juvenile, the family division. So I just want to put that out there that I don't think the judiciary will take a position on either of those um, two initiatives. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks. Um, and Eitan, you kind of got to this point um but i will so i'll just reiterate it which is that like every section of this report was really developed by a subcommittee like no committee had every voting member of rdap on it and um you know historically uh our first report um resulted from a vote and what the majority of people supported is what went into the report. primary section of the report. And if individuals or, you know, minority groups of people, minority in number groups of people dissented, um, then they could add a report as an appendix, which is what happened. So ultimately, to me, every section of this report, thanks to Elizabeth, is going to get voted on. And what is supported by a majority of the voting members of this panel is going to be what's in the report and should be reflected similarly from section to section. And, um, you know, uh, and the AGO and the SAO can, if they end up being in the minority, can add dissenting statements um, as we've done historically. Thanks. I agree. Anybody else? Okay. Folks, we've done it. We really, we, this, yeah, good. I'm happy right now. I know you're all looking at me like, why is he happy right now? I don't know. Um, I feel like we have really hashed out the major issues that are, were in front of us for this particular report. Um, there's a little bit more writing to do, shocker. Um, we've got our homework cut out for us. I now can start writing the executive summary, which is also like the preamble. Um, the preamble is like an executive summary. I can start doing that now. Um, and we'll do that. And as I say, I will mail that to you, um, email 
if there's no objection to that, I will put that in as soon as I get it done. I'm trying my hardest to, now that I've got everything, I can actually really concentrate on it. And because I didn't want to start it when there might be some questions still about some major stuff. And now I know where we're at. So I can do that. Um, Elizabeth, again, I you're a goddess. Thank you. I mean, I, God, I can't just do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> but um, thank you from the heart for that. Yeah, no problem. That's really useful and it's really wonderful. Um, does anyone else have anything? I I have a question on on our like okay, so we put in all the votes on that spreadsheet and we send it forward after we read through it. And I know there were questions on the chat, like, do we all get together to have quorum to vote? Or I'm just wanting to understand the process a little bit. We're going to have to. There's no way around that. That's the open meeting laws. And we will do that on the 13th of February. So we'll get a copy of stuff before the 13th so that we can vote on the 13th. God, okay. yes. Well, okay, sorry. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, you have to. I have to do that. <laughs> There's just no way around that. Yes. Rebecca. I have a new business suggestion for, and I don't know if we have any time for next month post vote, but if we do, uh, I just wanted to, to, to suggest that Chief Don Stevens email to us last month. Yes. Um, raising some concerns yes. about lack of, of, of recognition and and dropping down on the issue specific to Native American community Abenakis in, in Vermont um, that that we we that that I thought warranted some discussion by this panel uh, I didn't I have agree. time to address by email but I want okay thanks and I'll beg him to show up because I know he's very busy and frequently can't but I will I'll write him an abject you know note please i'll do anything dishes cook something but yes i will do that aaron you had your hand up oh i just wanted to um express gratitude to you Aton. this has been kind of a difficult <laughs> wonky process getting to this point and it feels like such a relief to be at almost the finish line, but also recognizing that you still have a lot of labor to do to get us to that finish line. And so I really just wanted to thank you and also apologize for my own procrastination on getting you things at the 11th hour. And hopefully we'll do better for our next report in 2026. But thank I, you. I, I have no doubt. And thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. It's very kind. Thanks. And um, I think we're where we're at. We need to be right now. I think we're as far along as we can be. And I'm really happy about that. Um, so I guess people would like to go have dinner and things like that. Let's do that formality. Can I, I you know, that's, this is always the awkward moment. I would entertain in motion. I move that we adjourn. Wonderful. Anyone want to second that? I second. second I'm good that. at that part. Damn, man. <laughs> people second. are like, we got second, we got 10th, we got 11th. All in favor, <laughs> scream aye. 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 Thank you, Aton. Thanks, Aton. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Aton. Bye. Bye. <laughs>